Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're coming from, whether or not you're in the depths of what used to be Atlantis, if there's still remnants of you, welcome, welcome, welcome. Perhaps you're coming from another planet in our solar system, maybe it's beaming with life, all that we don't know about, we don't know, but today's topic is actually that. We're going to be talking about other planets in our solar system system, specifically our nearest neighbor and probably the most famous planet outside of Earth, our cousin Mars. Chris, how are you doing today? Doing great, Brandon. Thanks for uh, being here with me today. And I'm really excited to talk about Mars. There is so much to cover. Today, we're just going to kind of cover a little bit of it and probably going to do a two-parter on this one as well. Now, Mars, uh, our word for Mars is actually uh, an old god, right? A, um, Roman a, god. A Roman god, right? War. Based on the Greek god. Uh, and Ares. It's, and it's always the god of war, no? Yeah, always, always. And we'll tackle as to why that might actually be, other than just mythological reasons. Um, we've got scientific evidence to support this idea of the planet being a planet of war. Now, I just thought it was because the planet was red. <laughs> blood. The planet of blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Easy Legolas. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that would be obviously the most simple explanation is that it's red. Thus, we think of blood and passion. And thus, it must be the god of war. Uh, but however, it does seem interesting that, um, you know, even our main hypothesize uh errs um of these ideas <laughs> say that there used to be maybe life there that was maybe extinguished and which i always think is an interesting thing um but uh, but yeah i keep hearing whispers through my curious uh mind and through my explorations that uh, that perhaps there was a civilization on mars at one point and perhaps they uh they may be already foreshadowing as to what may happen here on Earth as well. So very interesting stuff. And I'm very excited to be getting into this with you, Chris, and all of you watching. Yes, absolutely. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in today to our uh, our episode here on Mars. And just remember, this is all for entertainment purposes, guys and gals and all other beings watching this. Um, we're going to give Wait, you the saying, information that we can. You're saying you're not a Mars matician? <laughs> it's a new study of uh, mars called mars matician <laughs> no uh you know we're just going to present what we can and what we found and what we've researched over the years and uh, let us know in the comments below if you guys agree disagree have other information for us to look into or to add on to what we've been talking about but at the end of the day this is a show to entertain and and give information that uh can hopefully enlighten and in just honestly open everyone's minds to what could be possible. You know, we're in a complete, we're in a reality where everything's always evolving and changing. So we understand that. And we're just going to have some fun today on this really amazing topic because there's so much before we started recording this for those uh, watching and listening. I mean, Brandon was talking about other aspects of Mars and there's, there's so many, uh, uh, hidden histories of Mars that we hear about through sometimes whistleblowers and military and other secret projects talking about unbelievable things, underground bases, things like that. We're not going to get into that today, but that could be a future episode. Today, I want to dive into the Sumerian clay tablets, the, some of the work of Zachariah Sitchin, who talks about a bit of the history of Mars, or at least some parts of the history of Mars that we do have in actual written history. And then we're going to go into some scientific evidence to support this whole war planet hypothesis. So this is going to be pretty cool. Sounds juicy. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So I will start to share my screen here. And I want to start with uh, the work of Zachariah Sitchin. Um, this is on a site here that has just essentially, honestly, just copy and pasted um, from the actual Zachariah Sitchin website. Uh, so this is written by Zachariah. And... For those who don't know Zachariah Sitchin, he was not a uh, necessarily a translator of the Sumerian clay tablets. He took the work of already translated um, works of people that were incredibly, uh, you know, intellectual, uh, highly credentialed academics who knew this ancient, ancient, ancient language, one of the oldest languages on the planet. Well, Zachariah actually, so he, his whole thing was, he was able to, um, he studied ancient Hebrew texts, 
and ancient Hebrew was the closest we also have to the ancient Sumerian. Uh, it's such an old language. So uh, he was able to de decipher some uh, of the tablets and work on them and build on other people's research as well. I think um, and, like the thing I'm saying to it more is just that I think he gets a lot of criticism for, um, I think, the way he deciphers these things. But I, I've heard Billy Carson talk at length about Zachariah Sitchin and he says he was saying that, you know, Zachariah was really drawing upon the work of other um, absolutely credentialed academics who everyone in mainstream history and academia would absolutely um, accept their translations. So he wasn't exactly drawing things out of thin air like a lot of people would think because of the conclusions he drew, which were obviously incredible. We get into the Anunnaki, we get into the creation of the human race, we get into all these incredible uh, stories. But He's not really drawing this out of nothing. He's uh, he's basing it off of, like you said, uh, Hebrew translations, but also just the work of already, um, you know, established people. So without further ado, I, I, uh, sorry, go ahead. If I may, I just yeah. think with uh, Sitchin's work, I've read some of his books. And um, what's what's striking is just to remember that the uh, the ability of people who have those talents um, and have spent so much time studying ancient languages, it's not a large pool of people who possess this ability anymore. So there's always a lot of criticism towards uh, uh, Zachariah Sitchin. However, um, his work is is truly phenomenal. And if there were more people with the ability to do what he was able to do, uh, we might be able to build and expand upon his work. So it's almost like uh, he's done some groundbreaking work. It might be nice to see some expansion on that with new minds because he is no longer with us either. But uh, but it's it's a very shallow uh, talent pool when it comes to what he could offer. So 100%. that's my piece. And, you know, it's uh, when you bring that up, it reminds me of a, a really amazing researcher who's uh, who's uh, is a much more younger, vibrant, uh, kind of newer researcher on the scene. Uh, Matthew LaCroix, he's done a lot of collaborations with uh, Gaia Television. Uh, I think also he's been on now two History Channel shows. So he's getting up there. He's got a couple of amazing books. I definitely want to get him on the show, the podcast eventually. And he has, I believe I was re I was hearing him speak about he's been now studying the actual um, translations of the Sumerian clay tablets. So he will hopefully become one of these, again, people that are in a very small group, but he's uh, he's brilliant. So I highly recommend people check out the work of uh, Matthew LaCroix. So diving into this, you know, this history of Mars, you know, uh, it's really interesting when you read the Sumerian clay tablets, it, the, um, the Sumerians, they talk about Mars, not from the perspective of, you know, um, humans researching Mars, but they talk about it from the perspective of the Anunnaki. And it's really interesting. So let's read into this a little bit here. This is, these are the words of Zachariah Sitchin. So this is the Sumerian evidence. Uh, and they, they claim that Mars was basically a way station. This was a planet that perhaps the uh, Anunnaki used um, to travel back and forth from their planet, Nibiru to earth, uh, Mars being kind of sort of in the middle, depending on the um, planetary orbits. So let's go into this here. I'm reading from this page. So the evidence that for that was recorded in the wor the words and illustrations by the Sumerians, whose civilized uh, civilization blossomed in Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq for those uh, watching and listening some 6,000 years ago. So they did not claim the achievement of visiting Mars for themselves. Rather, they wrote on their clay tablets about the Anunnaki, which translates to those who from heaven, heaven to earth came. So who came to Earth from their planet Nibiru? A 12th, um, I'm just going to move this so I can actually read this properly here. Excuse me, folks. A 12th member of our solar system, counting as they did the sun, moon, and 10 planets, whose great elliptical orbit around the sun lasts some 3,600 Earth years. There's talking about this is the orbit of the planet Nibiru. Getting back into the text here. The many ancient texts unearthed by archaeologists that deal with the Anunnaki, their comings and goings, and the, astronom the astronomical knowledge, among other sciences, that they bequeathed to mankind have been revealed and explained in Zachariah's series of books, beginning with the 12th planet, which did you read that one, Brand? Which ones did you read from him? Was it the, uh, I know he did... Um, I read his first book and uh, and a bit of his second. I lent it out to a friend and I never got it back. But, uh, yes, 
I, I believe the first one was the 12th planet. And uh, it talks about Nibiru being the 12th planet and that they count back from outside the solar system. And they, they include every planet, including Pluto, which, you know, wasn't discovered till the 30s or something like that. And Earth was the uh, not the 10th planet, but I believe the 7th. If you count in. And they're counting from Pluto inward, I believe, rather I than believe, from... Yeah, it was Pluto, uh, Neptune, Neptune, Uranus, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth, the Moon, and then they had uh, Venus, Mercury, and then the Sun. Uh, and I am maybe missing one? Well, missing we've got Mars, right? And we've got Mars. Oh, right, Mars. I so, missed Mars. And then, and yes. so they're, they're calling it the way station, basically a stopover place between Nibiru and Earth. Which is interesting. So it continues on here. And amazingly, but true, a circular tablet that can be seen on display at the British Museum in London, which I really need to go there, uh, describes in eight segments various aspects of space travel between the Anunnaki's uh, planet Nibiru and the seventh planet, Earth. One segment in particular, enlarged here for clarity, shows and states that the route traveled by Enlil, which uh, translates, or perhaps his title was Lord of the Command, entailed passages or passage by seven planets. It also called for a route diversion between the planet uh, Dilgan, which is, I guess, Jupiter, and Apin, which is Mars. So I'm going to click onto this um, image right here. This is what he's talking about. This is an uh, illustration from this clay tablet. It's a circular clay tablet. And it's essentially kind of looks like, and what they've, at least Zachariah Sitchin has surmised, is some sort of a uh, celestial map in a way, which is absolutely fascinating that this was written some 6,000 years ago. I mean, kind of yeah, incredible. Their, their comprehension of the solar system is just, it, that's something that doesn't get talked about enough is uh, how the further back we go, the more we knew about the solar system and then we had to rediscover it. So. Unbelievable. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. And and we got to do more episodes just on Sumeria and these clay tablets in general, which we could go on and on and on, because the more you read them, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Uh, and I believe the UCLA website has a, um, a complete comprehensive archive of all the uh, um, clay tablets that have been translated archived. I don't think none, not all of them have been translated. I think actually a uh, majority of them have not yet been translated. Which... Well, like I said, there's not a, uh, a plethora of people with the ability to translate them. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, getting into this Mars is a way station. All right. So in their text, the Sumerians wrote that the Anunnaki traveled to earth in groups of 50. The first team under the leadership of EA, who's, uh, which translates to whose home is water, splashed down in the waters of the Persian Gulf, waded ashore, and then established Eridu, which translates to home in the faraway. And Eridu, um, FYI, is, uh, I mentioned Matthew LaCroix in, earlier in the podcast, and he's got some amazing research, more modern, uh, pretty recent research on Eridu. I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel. I should, uh, I'll put that in the show notes, because um, Eridu is a really important city. And unfortunately, because one, it's in Iraq, and of course, Iraq's been really difficult to do any archaeological work in for a long, 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 long time. And uh, unfortunately, it's been getting a lot of um, vandalism and other things. It's it's one of the most important sites on the planet. It's honestly, uh, arguably one of the homes and the birthplaces of humanity. And yet most people don't know about it. And uh, it's getting kind of trashed. And there's like literally only two or three photographs you can even see of this place on the entire internet. I mean, it's extremely unknown, yet unbelievably uh, important because of, as we just saw here, this is where the Anunnaki supposedly established their home base was in Eridu. I mean, that's something we want to check out. So back into the text here. In time, 600 Anunnaki were deployed on Earth and another 300 operated shuttlecraft between Earth and Mars. So here's an interesting pictorial evidence uh, for the Earth-Mars connection right here. For those listening, I'll explain it in a second. And it's provided by a uh, depiction on a cylinder seal now kept at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. So I'm going to click on this image for a second. And you'll notice um, a figure here on the left and a figure here on the right. 
We're going to read the descriptions of what these might mean. And this interesting, I'll say, object in the middle and uh, interesting circles on the left and a moon shape, these circles representing planets here. So uh, th yeah. that that object in the middle, um, that the winged globe that you see there, that usually represents Nibiru uh, for most of what they're doing. That might be a, a, a kind of an offshoot of it, but generally speaking, that circle with the with the wings um, generally represents their home planet in these, uh, and it's a symbol that you'll see echoed through history as well. So yeah, very common and uh, curious. So here it depicts the an astronaut or Eagle Man, and that would be on the left. Uh, yes, so it depicts an astronaut, an Eagle Man, on Earth, the planet marked with the seven dots, right? So this is on the left-hand side, the seven dots here, accompanied by the crescent moon, which you can see on the right, and an astronaut on Mars, on the far right here, right, with the six-pointed star symbol, the latter just de depicted as one from the fishermen class of astronauts, those equipped to splash down in waters. As you can see, there's a fin almost here on, uh, let's go back to the larger image, um, sort of a fin on this character here. Uh, like you said, the uh, five sort of star, starred circle there. Uh, you can also see this dolphin uh, caricature on the bottom. Yeah. Which is Hitchhiker's the, Guide to the Galaxy kind of vibes going on. There. Yeah, right. Thanks for all the fish. Um, so, yeah, between the two planets, an object is depicted that could only be a spacecraft with extended panels and antennas. That's what you were depicting. Uh, that's what you were mentioning as um, as a spacecraft, correct? Yeah. So uh, the fact that um, that it has that winged globe look, and then it's kind of been branched off from there, that might be also represent representative of it's. This is you know, um, this is what the Anunnaki's kind of symbol would be, right? Like uh, maybe we see in the American Air Force, they often have you know wings of like an eagle on things, right? So, and uh, I think you had a Freudian slip there. The star, I think what the, what the, what our author here is saying that because there's six points in the star, that's supposed to represent the sixth planet, which would be Mars by their counting. Yes. I think I said five earlier. I meant to say six. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And uh, I just can't help but to look at the fisherman's calf and how strong it looks. <laughs> this bulging muscle here. <laughs> <laughs> If that's even a calf, that's an interesting looking foot there. But, uh, you know, again, when you look at these ancient depictions, um, there's always a, I find an interesting mixture of metaphor and, uh, and actuality that you get in these. And that's where you have a bit of, uh, let's say, play with trying to decide what the hell these things mean. So this is interesting, a space base on Mars. So here we go. To maintain over thousands of years, um, a space base on Mars required water for survival. The fishmen's attire of uh, of the one on Mars suggests bodies of water on Mars, which, as a side here, we know is absolutely true. There was absolutely water on Mars. Even NASA and all of them admit that. Moreover, as detailed in the Lost Book of Enki, which is a really interesting book, I want to read that one. Um, water was used by the Anunnaki to propel their spacecraft. And the availability of, of water on Mars made it a suitable way station. So almost to just fuel up and I don't know, water, you know, helpful for survival in many other ways. I've seen some, uh, or I've seen on the web, at least um, potential pe uh, people that have supposedly, you know, um, powered their car with water. So, uh, Hey, maybe it's possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The people who seem to make engines run on water also seem to meet unfortunate ends. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing. I'm only laughing because of just the absurdity of our, our lovely uh, civilization here and how. No, uh, for all you inventors out there, please do make, uh, yeah. make free energy for everybody and save us all. Please. Yeah. Please be the next Nikola Tesla. Thank you very much. So, yeah, uh, this base on Mars, basically, this was potentially a way station. So back into the text here, the Anunnaki, uh, Zachariah has concluded in his books, used Mars not just for a quick stopover. They also created a permanent space base on Mars, complete with structures and roads. In Genesis Revisited, another one of Zachariah's books, he reproduced numerous photos, uh, photographs taken by NASA's 
uh, Mariner 9 in 1972 and the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976. That clearly showed a variety of artificial structures there, some of which were on in, or in the Cydonia area with its famed face on Mars. Now, we're going to go into a lot more of these crazy anomalies and details in another episode, the next episode, part two of the Mars. What face are they talking about, Chris? Well, we'll get into that in a sec, but I do have it pulled up here. And that's the one I think uh, even the non alternative history slash conspiracy slash whatever fun, loving, open minded people. I think everyone's probably seen that face on Mars. It's quite, quite famous. Um, so so that's essentially um, the Coles notes of, of Zachary Sitchin's, you know, historical, um, let's say, work that he's done on with, you know, the Sumerian clay tablets and the Anunnaki and their whole history of coming from Nibiru to Mars to Earth back and forth. So the thing that I want us to focus on with this for this episode from this historical perspective is the fact that they didn't just use it as a way station. They established an actual base there. And we'll look at a couple of little pieces of evidence of uh, as to how that actually could have been possible in a second, because it's just something that's, I don't know, when I first went into this area of research on Mars, it blew my mind that I was even able to find on Google searches, archaeology on a planet, not earth. And the, yeah, more, in, the, more, and the more interesting thing is we're going to look at it in a second is that the archaeology doesn't look that much different on Mars than it, and than it would on, uh, on planet earth here. So before we get into the archaeology, um, I wanted to go, you know what? No, let's go into the archaeology first. So then... I, I just have an interjection here, Chris. Please. Um, <clears throat> just for our listeners, the Anunnaki story, okay, it's hard to pinpoint when they're talking. However, what is uh, kind of understood is that we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of years when they first came. Because in this storyline, what the Sumerians believed and what they're trying to communicate with us through these tablets is that we are we are humans are, are a byproduct of a bit of like um kind of a doctor uh, an island of dr moro kind of situation where they took genes from people who were here uh or creatures that were here maybe something like a bigfoot or or a wild man or a pre-human that we might think of today uh and then some of their genes and created the humans um yeah. So, and then there's also the, uh, yeah, the Nephilim that maybe were uh, a byproduct of kind of interbreeding amongst humans in them. But where I'm going with this is that this is a very, very far back in history. So if they're talking about water on Mars and you're going, well, obviously if we say there's remnants of water on Mars, uh, we'd be looking at uh, a time before humans had, had eyes on Mars. So um, who knows what it looked like back then when, when these tablets are describing it. 100%. You know, and I think that actually leads into, instead of going into the archaeological ruins for a second here, I want to go into um, what, what the, so the Anunnaki, when you read more about them, they were not the most peaceful race. Um, they had some members of the Anunnaki. Remember, it's, it's a, it's a whole bunch of beings. They may not have all been even, even the same race or even necessarily all the same exact species. Uh, they could have been from a planet that had a multi- species um, situation going on there. We don't know. But one of the things is that they were pretty aggressive. They had a lot of turmoil and they definitely had a lot of war going on. And uh, this leads into this whole idea of Mars being this planet of war. Is there even any evidence to support this? Well, uh, yeah, there definitely is. So we're going to get into the work of Dr. John Brandenburg, who is a uh, plasma physicist. And has worked with, um, you know, nuclear weapons uh, and has a very intimate knowledge of this uh, science. And I'm just going to read a quick excerpt here and then we're going to watch a brief um, lecture from Dr. John Brandenburg. And uh, when I first heard this, man, did, uh, did I have to re-research this again and again because I just didn't even believe that this was possible. This so, is exciting. This is really interesting. So I'm going to read from this quickly here. So plasma physicist, Dr. John Brandenburg, has received much attention for his assertion that a thermonuclear war on Mars wiped out life on the planet some 180 million years ago. Now, first of all, that 180 million years has been 
debated significantly. And he's also changed that date many times. So put a pin in that one because who the hell knows? Well, when we're talking about 180 million years ago, I mean, that's like us trying to pinpoint the dinosaurs, right? It's it's not going to be exact. You're yeah. guessing at best. And there's different things that could maybe shape your opinion on that. And as evidence unfolds, probably so did those dates, right? I mean, look at what we think about our human origins. That that needle keeps doing this the more we we, we discover new things. So oh yeah. And the older things also seem to get too if with our with our history. But you know what? It's less important for this uh for this idea anyway. What's really more interesting is what's coming up here. So Brandenburg cites the existence of radioactive elements in the Martian soil and the atmosphere as proof of this nuclear catastrophe. So he's quoted in saying, the Martian surface is covered with a thin layer of radioactive substances, including uranium, thorium, and radioactive potassium. Brandenburg also points out uh, points to elevated readings of the gas xenon-129 in the Martian atmosphere as the most important evidence in support of his theory, since xenon-129 is a rare substance, which is typically found in the fallout of a nuclear explosion. At one time, Brandenburg believed these nuclear explosions to have been generated by natural processes, but he later changed his mind and now believes that nuclear weapons were used during a Martian civil war that ultimately led to planetary extinction. Now, most scientists who have studied Martian chemistry believe the xenon-129, it's an isotope in the planet's atmosphere, was created by a cosmic ray bombardment. So they obviously reject Brandenburg's nuclear war scenario. Um, but, uh, and they, they just dismiss it because there's too little evidence. But to be honest, we're gonna watch in this, um, in this next video, there's a lot of evidence to support this. Um, and by a lot, I mean, the the mere fact of the Xenon-129 is, uh, it's it's quite compelling at the very least to, to do more research and not dismiss it. It may not end up being true, but it's at least worth m looking more into at the very least just to debunk it. But let's see, because Dr. John, John Brandenburg is is not um, just any old scientist. This guy is one of the, would be one of the best people to actually recognize this signature of the iso isotope Xenon-129. So let's just hear from the guy himself here on this video. Um, let's go right into it. Let's hear from Dr. Oh, I got to make sure that the uh, sound is going to be on for this. So hold on. Let me stop Classic it. Classic Chris. You know what, guys, when you got to produce everything on your own, hey, this is what you're happens. not uh, claiming to be a nuclear physicist. So, well, yeah, that's just the way she goes. So, yeah. So, Chris, while you pull that up, I'm just thinking out loud here. And and people who are at the top of their field or very respected in their field mm -hmm. who are going, hey, now, hold on a second. This is super weird. Why are we detecting this? And then for us to be so quick to um, to ignore it and cast it aside and say, oh, it must be natural, which, by the way, it could. that was my first instinct, too. Like my skeptic brain started going, going I wonder if if there's anything that causes natural nuclear reactions. I mean, like the sun is doing its own thing. Um, right. I, but, I, uh, I thought the same thing. And 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 it, why couldn't it? Right. Or what if uh, uh, some asteroid with um, unknown isotopes or something smashes into the planet? I mean. To me, there could be so many explanations for it. However, you're absolutely right. Um, and so is this scientist here uh, to say if, you know, if there is evidence to suggest that this could be one of the scenarios, we should be exploring it because we're not going to progress scientifically unless we are in an age of suppression that uh, that if we don't know the answers, we should be looking for any possible answer. So. Yeah. And one of the criticisms I hear all the time for the Mars rover and things like that, where they're, they're looking for microbial bacteria and these like the most uninteresting, in my opinion, forms of life you could possibly be looking for, even though it's, I guess, interesting when they do discover these bacterial forms. But in my mind, I'm like, come on, guys, <laughs> like, I'm sure there's some, there's such more. Show me the Mars squirrel. Yeah. There's always a squirrel. You know, um, it, there's just so much there. And we'll see that in the next episode when we go through just a plethora of images and video of uh, of these, um, you know, things, anomalies that are captured from the NASA and JPL uh, images that are usually quite um, low resolution, unfortunately, which is another 
question as to why are you always giving us the, the crap images here? But let's watch and listen to Dr. John Brandenburg talk about his theory really briefly here. And what we're going to, this is a whole lecture. It's about an hour long. I'll put it, of course, in the show notes. Um, we're just going to watch a couple minutes. And this particular portion is just about the xenon, um, whatever that was, 129, I believe, xenon um, isotope that they find in the atmosphere of Mars and how it's anomalous compared to every other planet. So uh, here we go. Here is Mars xenon versus Earth xenon. Earth is in blue. You can see they overlay uh, very well for the isotopes 132, 134, etc. But at 129, Mars has two and a half times more xenon 129 than the Earth does. And by the way, it has this, you could put any other planet up there and it would look the same. Mars is different from every other planet. It has this big load of xenon-129. And sadly, this is weapon signature. If you match this xenon to the output of a hydrogen bomb, you get a, a very good match. There is only one place in the solar system where in a planetary atmosphere, you find anything like the xenon signature of Mars, and that is the part of the US, of the atmosphere of the Earth that has changed dramatically since 1945, when we discovered nuclear weapons. So, I mean, that's all I wanted to show you guys, because that's a bombshell right there. Like, what? No pun intended. Oh my God. Dude, so basically, did he say over the US? So they're talking about like the Nevada desert where they test nuclear bombs. Not just the test, but of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? Right. And and just so everyone knows, that what I found was shocking is uh, there are nuclear bombs being detonated all the time on Earth uh, in testing sites. And that just seems like a terrible idea. But, uh, there's a I lot digress. that we there's a lot that we do. <laughs> I just what are we doing, guys? Um, you know, it's one of um, this is a total sidebar. But what I've heard from, you know, uh, insiders, whistleblowers uh, in the ET UFO UAP community is that the reason that all of a sudden extraterrestrial sightings just started to go through the roof were once we started detonating nuclear bombs. And well, one of one of the theories that's what, uh, that's that's what we had in our in our inner earth series. You should check out that episode. Admiral Byrd, that was one of his big things is he said, you know, they're like, hey, by the way, it's a good thing you're here because we have just started paying attention to you surface dwellers again because you're launching bombs. Yeah, you're you nuking our planet. Wind. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, what do you do? We live here too. We live, we live on this thing, this beautiful, this beautiful rock, you know, like this is this beautiful organism, and you're bombing it with a pretty destructive, you know, force. And this is the thing, and I don't know. Um, let, let us know in the comments what you think about this one here. But I heard something that it's not just the radiation, not just the obvious catastrophic, you know, terrible uh, ramifications of a bomb like that. It's also frequencies um, that emanate from a nuclear blast apparently go way beyond the planet and they go throughout the solar system. And this is complete from what I've heard from an insider that had interactions with some extraterrestrials, but they were saying that it's disrupting a lot of other planets. And so these other mm -hmm. alien or ET life forms on these other planets are not just concern for our well-being here on planet earth which a lot of them are but they're also like guys can you stop like screwing over our planets because your bombs have got this really bad frequency residue that's it's forget the radiation stuff there's like a some vibrational frequency uh something that's going on that's that's actually disrupting a lot of these planets and some of their technologies and things like that so we're, we're just we're really causing a bit of a ruckus in our in our um, our neighborhood here in the in the solar system at the very least and it's getting a lot of other life forms kind of looking at us going oh man like eh, 
can these guys just grow up a little bit here? Like, holy cow, man. <laughs> it's funny. Well, a lot of the UFO sightings there are on, um, that have been leaked that have, uh, you know, shots of them are people who apparently have countries apparently have launched nuclear missiles, whether it be tests or whether it be an attack. And all of a sudden this weird object shows up, a little light beam hits it. And this thing is like nullified. So if there's any truth to those reports, um, yeah, it sounds like we're being babysat. Yeah. And we're like infants with handguns and people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So Dangerous. who knows? Maybe all the threats of nuclear war. Uh, you know, I would like that theory that uh that it can't happen because we have angels watching over us, but uh well, maybe know, that's wishful thinking. I'm sure there's some element to that, but at the end of the day, I mean, if we keep if we keep along this course, it's all, it's just inevitable that disaster will come one day. But the hope, and I would say my optimism on it, is that you know, on a consciousness and spiritual level, where we are awakening and we're, we're we are rediscovering our connectivity to one another, the planet, the cosmos, everyone like that. And I think with a couple more generations, we'll uh, we'll have moved through this idiotic phase of self destruction. <laughs> Well, I've never met any. Has, has anyone ever met anyone who has been like, you know what? Let's nuke them. Yeah. Let's nuke them. That's the answer to our problems. Let's just nuke our neighbors. It's okay. We don't share water and soil with them. <laughs> we wouldn't probably get along just great with them over our coffee. God, right? let's just nuke them. I know the average person. I, I, I still I still think humans are great on a, on a one-to-one basis. It's just when we uh, are oppressed by crazy powers that be and we get all whipped up into a frenzy that we get a little crazy. But I digress. I think we should move on to a little bit of the physical archaeological evidence that we do see on this planet Mars. We're going to skim through this just for time's sake. And then I want to finish the episode with a really interesting, fascinating bit of research by none other than the CIA themselves. And I will leave it only at that because you got to stay to the end to check out that interesting bit of research done in the 80s by the CIA of all people, of all organizations. So let's go back to uh, probably the first big, um, let's say the first big piece of uh, potential evidence that came out in, the, I believe, the 70s. For, uh, for Mars that got the whole world in a frenzy. And that was, of course, the face on Mars, that classic image right here. And this is, uh, of course, I can just zoom in here for those listening. It's the face on Mars. If you don't know what that is, it is a uh, large um, mountain-like um, structure, not structure potentially, but or a geological feature, whatever it ends up being um, on the surface of Mars that just looks literally like a face, especially when the light is hitting it at a certain angle. Looks like a face looking right back at you. A little foreboding, but uh, but also pretty cool. And this is in a region called Cydonia. Cydonia is uh, a region on the planet Mars that has attracted a lot of scientific and popular interest. And that's because not only is there that face on Mars, but there's a lot of structures around that area, potentially. And you know, it's um, there's we're going to go into this in the next episode with lots of these um, archaeological anomalies and just straight up anomalies. I mean, not even archaeological. They could be creatures or other weird things. That's going to be the next episode because there's so many things like that on Mars. But this is where it all started uh, was really the face on Mars right here. And actually, more recently, we did get newer imagery of it, which are these images here now. Uh, with the lighting, it really changes that whole idea of the eyes, mouth, and nose feature here. But it's still an interesting structure. It's huge, by the way. I mean, I forget the exact, I um, uh, wonder if it shows it in here, but uh, the exact, uh, 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 no, don't exactly have it, but it's, oh yeah, it's about a two kilometer long, um, <laughs> you know, uh, structure of some kind huge these these structures that we find on mars are not small they are massive of course we are seeing them from um from satellites or um uh i mostly satellites are, are what we're seeing this from so that's the famous one and i wanted to show one more for for this episode today which is the dnm pyramid this is a, a, a landform also in the cydonia region so this is potentially one of the uh 
This is also one of the areas that potentially got nuked, perhaps, because this was where we find some of the most the most amount of structures and potential where there could have been a, a base or even a civilization at one point. And this uh, this image is really interesting. It's, I believe, a five sided kind of pyramid here. Um, I'm going to read. Ooh, okay, there, buddy. I'm going to read a bit of the details surrounding this image. Um, this is from. Uh, NASA's website here and um, oh yeah so what's really interesting about this is uh, a couple of things so like every other unusual formation on Mars this stunning feature too may have been caused by erosion or something else but it provokes the question, what would a constructed monument look like after 100,000 years or more of erosion? And that's the thing we got to think about when we're looking at a lot of these things. There's a lot of time that very likely would have uh, elapsed since when it happened, whenever this nuclear, you know, let's say there was a nuclear war of some kind, when that happened until to this day, this could have been thousands, if not maybe millions of years. But then I've also heard other people talk about Mars and because there is barely any atmosphere left on it, um, erosion and things like that can happen a lot quicker. So I'm not sure. Let us know in the comments if you know more about that. Um, what's interesting about this, though, is if you can, we see different sort of depictions of it. You see the star shape of it, essentially. So we've got one, two, three, four, five sides. And when you draw them out there, You've got a really interesting looking geometric shape. Now, I watched an interview with uh, my friend, my good friend of mine, Dr. Robert Schock, and he was on uh, History Channel's, I believe it was either Ancient Aliens or um, Unexplained. I can't remember what show. And he was talking, there's a whole episode on Mars, and they were talking about this exact, uh, the DM, DNM pyramid. And, you know, he's a geologist, Dr. Robert Schock, and he looks at this and says, this is very ungeological this is this does not look natural uh, you really don't find this in nature and so i'm going to pull up one more image here of what happens when people trace different uh, geometry shapes over this thing and you get really interesting angles that seem to come up um quite uh commonly and you've got this 19.5 degree angle that seems to come up a lot and this 40.893 angle that is also common throughout this uh, shape of this object, whatever this is. So there's mathematics, you know, that when, when you can get geometry and consistent mathematics, eh, probably not nature, probably constructed to some degree. So we're just kind of glossing over in this episode, a bit of the history and a bit of the archeology span that's potentially allegedly on Mars. And I wanted to end the episode today with a really curious document that Brandon and myself came across uh, a couple of years ago, declassified from the good old CIA. And this is uh, a program that they were, and they've been doing this for a long time, which is remote viewing. And that could be a whole other podcast in of itself. I actually just did a recent podcast for Ancient Mysteries on Earth on the Mastermind podcast with um, a good friend of mine, Alan St uh, Steinfeld. And he is also a teacher, among many other things, he's a teacher of remote viewing. And I actually kind of want to get him back on just to talk about remote viewing for an entire episode, because we're going to read a document that was declassified from the CIA uh, done in the 80s. And it was a remote viewing project for the planet Mars. Why on earth would the CIA be remote viewing Mars? I, I still can't wrap my head around that one. What is, what is the Central Intelligence Agency <laughs> remote viewing a planet? And not just that, but the remote viewing it like a million years ago. And so, this is like, by the way, this is just the fact that they're even using remote viewing as a tool speaks so much to the mysteries of our abilities, of the world, of the universe. And then to have them actually have these documents, just incredible. Chris, just as a side note, uh, I know we're about to read this. Uh, it is Armageddon outside my my apartment right now. They are tearing up the entire road, so uh, you might hear a uh, a low rumble, and I do apologize. Yeah, I, I I don't hear anything on my end, so I think you're good. We're you're in a beautiful sound booth, and I am. 
just at an Airbnb right now. So uh, you're you're doing great. Sounds good to me. So this is uh, this is just nuts, guys, uh, guys, gals, beings from all around watching and listening. This is just crazy. So this is on the CIA.gov website. You will see the link to this in the show notes. Go check it out. Have a read. This was done on May 22nd, 1984. And uh, I'm going to use uh, Brandon's acting talents here because it basically reads like a script. This is a transcription, but it's with two people. So we're going to read it like a script here. I'm going to read this uh, very brief uh, detail before we get into the actual transcription. So here's what they say. Method of site acquisition, sealed envelope coupled with geographic coordinates. The sealed envelope was given to the subject immediately prior to the interview. For those listening and watching, the subject is the remote viewer, just so you know. This envelope was not opened until after the interview. In the envelope was a three by five card with the following information. The planet Mars, time of interest, approximately 1 million years BC. Selected geographic coordinates provided by the parties requesting the information were verbally given to the subject during the interview. So here's the thing. I don't know a lot about remote viewing. And please let us know in the comments below if you have more knowledge about remote viewing, uh, how the procedures go. This is why I want to ask my friend Alan more about remote viewing, because I don't know exactly because I know with remote viewing, this the person who is the remote viewer really can't know anything. The whole point is to have absolutely no bias and to have zero information beforehand. So the little bit that I know about remote viewing is that it's using your consciousness, which is non-local, to access information in our universe that basically using the idea of uh, quantum entanglement to access information from any space, any place, anywhere in time in the universe, believe it or not. And this sounds crazy, but... <laughs> The Russians got into this a while ago, and then, you know, that got the attention of the U.S., and then they got into it, and then they both started seeing so, so much success in their results that, well, they kept doing it, and they invested millions, if not probably billions at this point, into remote viewing. And I would, I would bet, I don't know for sure, but I would bet that this is some sort of ancient uh, practice. It's dealing with it's it, we're back we're getting back into the science of spirituality we're getting back into psychic abilities and um, you know this is this is stuff that I, I yeah of course the ancients knew about this and they were far more um, knowledgeable with the spiritual sciences the psychic sciences if you want to call them that um, the the basically the abilities that we all have to this day everyone can remote view uh, every this is not a special gift. You know, in a lot of superhero movies, it's always like, oh, I got bit by a radioactive spider and now I have these special abilities. We actually have so many special abilities already programmed into our DNA, into our bodies, uh, and that our consciousness can operate. And one of them is remote viewing. And the remote viewing is basically able to gather information, remote view a situation, an event, anytime, any, any anywhere. And it's incredible. And just took me a long time to wrap my head around it because man does it just it sounds beyond science fiction but hey here it is in reality from the cia themselves so we're going to read the transcript for you and then we're going to finish off our, our, our episode there i will i will play the cia uh, agent that on this transcript is um called mon m-o-n uh i don't know what, what that stands for probably monitor 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 is what subject. i would guess and obviously sub is subject. So subject is the remote viewer, which will be Brandon and I will be the CIA person uh, monitor. So um, let's 1984. So here we go. Um, plus 10 minutes ready to start. Okay. All right. Now using the information in the envelope, I pro I've provided exclusively focusing your attention. Now using the information in the envelope, focus on 40.889 degrees North, 9.55 degrees west i want to say it looks like uh i don't know it sort of looks i kind of got an oblique view of a uh pyramid uh, or pyramid form it's very high it's kind of sitting in a large depressed area all right it's yellowish uh okra colored all right move on move in time to the time indicated in the envelope I've provided for you and describe what's happening. 
I'm tracking severe, severe clouds, more like dust storm. Uh, it's geologic problem. Seems to be like a, just a minute, I, I've got to iron this out. It's really weird. Just report the raw perceptions at the time. You're still early, early in the session. I'm looking at a, a after effect of a major geological problem. Okay. Go back to the time before the geologic problem. Uh, total difference. It's, uh, it's before, no, uh, I don't know how it's, it's, it's like mountains of dirt appear and then disappear when you go before. I, I see, uh, large flat surfaces, very, uh, smooth angles, walls. They're really large though. I mean, they're megalithic. Um, all right. At this period in time now, before the geologic activity, look around in and around this area and see if you can find any activity. I'm seeing uh, it, it's like a perception of a shadow of people, very tall, thin. It's only a shadow. It, it's as if they were there and they're not, not, not there anymore. Okay, go back to a period of time where they are there. Uh, okay. uh, it's like I, I get a lot of static on, on a line and everything. It's breaking up all the time, very fragmentary pieces. Just report the raw data. Don't try to put things together. Just report the raw data. I just keep seeing very large people. They appear thin and tall, but they're very large, uh, wearing some kind of strange clothes. All right. Now, holding in this time period, holding in this time period, I want you to move from your physical location in space to another physical location, but in this time period. Move now to 46.45 north, 350. 353.22 east move in this time to 46.45 uh, and 353.22 east deep inside of a cavern not, not a cavern more like a canyon um i'm looking up up at the sides of a steep wall that seems to go on forever and there's like a, a structure with a it's like the wall of the canyon itself has been carved again I, i'm getting a very large structures no uh no no uh in intricacies huge sections of smooth stone do the structures have insides and outsides yes yes they're very it, it's like a rabbit warren corners of rooms they're they're really huge i don't feel like i'm standing in one it's just really huge perception is that the ceiling is very high walls very wide. Um, yes, that would be correct. All right. I'd like to move now to another location nearby. All right. Move from this point in time to 45.86 north, 354.1 east. They have a, appears to be the end of a very large road and there's a marker thing that's very large. Keep Getting Washington Monument overlay. It's like an, an obelisk. All right. From this point, then, let's move to another point. Move to 35.26 north, 213.24 east. It's like uh, I'm in the middle of a huge circular basin of the range mountains by almost all the way around. Very ragged, ragged mountains, very tall. Basin's very, very, very large. Scale seems to be off or something. It's just really big. Everything's big. I understand the problem. Just continue. See, just, uh, I see just a right angle corner to something, but that's all. I, I don't see anything else. Okay. Let's move into a little uh, different place. Very close. Move from the point you are now in this time to 34.6 north. 213.09 east. The cluster of squares up and down. Um, it Okay, it's like you want to make them square anyway. They're almost flush with the ground and it's like they're connected. Something very white or reflects light. Mm -hmm. What's your position of observation as you look at this thing that reflects light? I'm amid a, a bleak left angle. Sun is, uh, sun is weird. Look back down at the ground now, and we're going to move just a little bit from this place, just a little bit from this place, 34.57 north, 212.22 east. 
it's like uh, I I can just perceive um uh like a, a radiating pattern of some kind. It's like some really uh strange intersecting kind of roads that are dug into valleys, you know, where a road is just a little below the edge. Tell me about the shapes of these things. Mm. They're like real neat channels cut. They're very deep. It's like the road went down. Okay. Now I have a lit. Now I have. Uh, I notice electricity. You're nulled out a little bit, and I want you to stay deep and recapture your focus here. It's really tough. It seems like it's just always very sporadic. I realize that it's very important that you maintain your focus. I have a movement exercise again for you, and this time uh, is some considerable distance away. So holding the focus in time, remember the focus in time that you had before, and moving now to 15 degrees north, 198 degrees east. See the um, intersecting, uh, whatever these are, uh, are aqueduct type things, these rounded bottom carved channels like roadbeds. See, um, Pointed uh, tops of something on the horizon. E even the horizon looks funny and weird. It's like uh, different, misty. Like it's really far away, very vague. Okay. Another movement now to 80 degrees south, 80 degrees. Yeah, uh, 64 degrees east. See pyramids. Can't tell if it's overlay or not because they're different. Okay. Do these pyramids have insides and outsides? Mm -hmm. got both and, and, and they're huge it's really a it, it's an interesting perception I'm getting this is the CIA saying to I guess uh, maybe one of his colleagues I think that he's losing his ability to move accurately but he is attracted to things that are interesting so we're going to go with his own we're going to let him go ahead and explore what seems to be interesting to him rather than move on to the targets indicated here it's filtered from storms or something. Say that again. They're like shelters from storms. These structures you're seeing? Yes, yes. Designed for that. Okay. Go inside one of them, and uh, these, and find some activity to tell me about. Different chambers, but they're almost stripped of any kind of furnishings or anything. It's like... Uh... Strictly functional place for sleeping or that's not a, that's not a good word. Hibernations, some form. I, I can't get a real raw input. Storms, savage storm and sleeping through storms. Tell me about the ones who sleep through the storms. Mm. Uh, very tall again, very large people. But but they're thin. They they look thin because of their height, and they dress like in. Oh. It's like a real light silk, but it's not flowing type of clothing. It, it's cut to fit. Move close to one of them and ask them to tell you about themselves. They're ancient people. They're uh, they're dying. It's past their time or age. Tell me about this. Very philosophical about it. They're looking for a a way to survive, and they just can't. Can't seem to get their way out. They 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 can't seem to find their way out. So they're hanging on while they look or wait for something to return or something coming with the answer. What is it they're waiting for? They're uh, evidently was um a, a group or a party of them that went to find a new place to live. It's like I'm getting all kinds of overwhelming input of the corruption of their environment. It's it's failing very rapidly. And this group went somewhere, like a long way to find another place to live. What was the cause of this atmospheric disturbance or environmental disturbance? I see a picture. I see a picture of like... A, Oh hell, it's it's almost a warp in. Oh God, this is mm, this is difficult. It's it's going. Let's see the raw data. Okay, uh, I get a globe. Uh, it's like a globe that goes through a comet's tail. It's though a river or something, but it, it's very cosmic, like space pictures. Okay, 
Now, before you leave this individual, ask him if there is any way that you can ask him if he knows who you are and is there any way you can help him in the present predicament? All I get is that they must just wait. Doesn't know who I am. I think he perceives I'm a hallucination or something. Okay. When the others left, these people are waiting. When the others left, how did they go? Get an impression of them. I don't know what the hell it is. It, it looks like at the inside of a large, some larger boat, very rounded walls with shiny metal. Go along with them on their journey and, and find out where they it is they go. Impression of a really crazy place with, with volcanoes and gas pockets and strange plants. Very, very volatile place. It's very much like going from the frying pan into the fire. Dif difference is that there seems to be a lot of vegetation where the other place did not have it. And different kind of storm. All right. It's time to come back now to the sound of my voice into present time to right now, the 22nd of May, 1984, the sound of my voice. Move now back to the room, back to the sound of my voice, back further now to the sound of my voice on the 22nd of May, 1984. And that ends the interview. Um, yeah, so there you go, folks. That was, uh, you would think it was a script, honestly, from something yeah, out of Stranger like Things. It reads like one for crying out loud. Uh, Brandon and myself have written and read many scripts and I would I was forgetting that I was reading something off the CIA CIA.gov website. Yeah, it reads crying. pretty naturally, really. It, I mean, it really does. Um and there's just there's just so many things that come out of that. And you know, uh, we got to wrap this episode up, but uh, honestly, there's the, okay. For one, they mentioned pyramids. Well we were looking at pyramids earlier and in the next episode we're going to look at more of them. Uh, they mentioned beings that were tall and slender. Who knows? Were they Anunnaki? Were they other? I get the vibe of uh, of the like colossi of Egypt, those thin waist, um, you know, elongated skull type uh, statues we see. That's where my brain, that's what I was picturing. But yeah, yeah. Um, uh, right. Anything's possible. I, it's just, it's all up to uh, so much interpretation. But you know, I go back to, oh, and then they were mentioning again, this, this, they were surviving something, you know, what yeah, surviving. Hibernating, like stasis, right. And, and what I heard too, uh, I've heard theories about the great pyramid of Giza here on planet earth that not only, I mean, it's many, many things, but one of the things that it could have been was also a, um, a way to survive a major cataclysm, a small select, a uh, few people could have perhaps stayed in there or, um, there could have been a, a structure underneath that pyramid but either way it was a a way to survive a major cataclysm maybe that's also what uh this function was for this pyramid on mars uh, who knows but we know that there was definitely some form of a nuclear blast through the work of dr john brandenburg um or at the very least major cataclysms that decimated the planet that was once an earth-like planet which even nasa agrees that was the case at one point so this story that we're hearing from the uh, CIA uh, documents of this remote viewing, you know, interview are weirdly connecting to some of this history of the Sumerian clay tablets. It's connecting to some of the science that we're seeing with the, um, the isotopes in the atmosphere indicating a nuclear blast. We're seeing, uh, I, I just saw so many connections to the CIA document and this, you know, Blows my mind, man. It blows my mind. Some of this stuff. Uh, th there's so much yeah, history. It's crazy. Well, like ancient mysteries on Earth is is gonna have to just go off planet many more times because there's so much more interesting history in our solar system than there is just on this beautiful planet of ours, of good old Gaia. So, wow, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> well, saying that, why don't you all stay tuned for our next episode dealing with anomalies on Mars and ancient structures. So, guys, I think that's all the time we have for today. I think we ran a little bit long today, but yep. that's okay. We were getting right into the thick of it, and you stayed along for the journey of your hearing my outro now. So we really thank you for that. And please do comment, like, subscribe, uh, check out Chris Noble Music on Spotify. And as always, for only 33 cents a day, you can support this beautiful content creator as he goes around the world looking at ancient sites. He's actually in Greece right now uh, and checking out 
the Mediterranean for all sorts of ancient anomalies right now. So, Chris, I I really respect the work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you to our viewers for being a part of it. Any last words to our beautiful uh, audience here? Well, just stay curious as always, open-minded, kind, and, uh, you know, wow, we just have so much more to learn. I, uh, I'm i actually kind of blown away by the, uh, the episode today. It's, uh, it really just, it boggles my mind that we have so much more to learn just even beyond our own planet. And there's so much already on our planet. So thanks again, everyone, for being a part of this. We really appreciate you and uh, really looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. So take care. And we look care. forward to seeing your comments below as well. So ciao for now, everyone. Stay tuned and we'll get back to you soon. Adios.